So I'm going to rotate it a little bit. There we go. And you can see it's shining a little bit of light on the wall. We could take the whole thing and scale it a little bit, and that might kind of help make it a little more visible. Oh, also, when I hit play, let me make sure that I'm playing from the location of the camera and not from the player start. That way we don't accidentally jump around to a location we don't really want to be at. So what I'd like to have happen here is be able to walk up to this light and just turn it on and off using the E key. Right now when I hit E, all the cows blow up, so let's fix that first. I'm going to go over to my project settings once again. You remember on my inputs, we took those action mappings and we had cow self-destruct, currently slave to E. Let's change that over to R. Push that one key over. And then we're going to add a new action mapping, which I will call use. We'll expand that. We'll actually set this one to the E key. That's a, a little more conventional, something you might have actually seen in one, two, or 5,000 different games you might have played. Now here's the deal. Um, our cow spawner, we set up earlier, we cheated. We told it it should always be listening out for inputs from the player, but generally that's not how you want to handle things. You want to be a lot more, um, I guess, elegant with how you handle inputs and how you pass them off between different players. So let's start there. Let's uh, set up our little wall sconce here so that it can dynamically hand off control to the player and take it away. And a common way to handle that is via proximity. Uh, only when the player is close to something should they be able to actually use it. When they step away from it, they shouldn't be able to use it anymore. That's pretty easy to set up in Blueprint. It's, uh, in fact, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to how you used to do things in Kismet, if you've ever played with that. You had things like trigger volumes and whatnot. We're going to do something really similar. Let's go over to our components list. And here, we can see the wall sconce, and we can see the light component that makes it up. To this list of components, we're going to add a box component. Now we're going to resize this a little bit so we can move it around freely, we can scale it, we have all the same types of controls that we had in the viewport. But we'll make this a little bit wider, it doesn't need to be super wide, let me pull that in just a little. And we'll kick up its thickness, and then I'm going to try to make it kind of flush with the back of the light fixture. It does not have to be perfect, this doesn't necessarily need to be an exact science. But if you get a lot of these overlapping, you could run into problems. You want to keep this uh, fairly trimmed down to just the object you want to interact with. Let's call this, let's actually give this a name, so we'll rename it Trigger. Perfect. Now, back over here in our graph, we're not really worried about the construction script. In this case, just to show off, what the construction script is doing is allowing us to set some public variables for our lights. So you see over here, I have the brightness that I can adjust, and you get real-time feedback, and you can take the light color and make that really anything we want. And that's because each time I make a property change, the construction script is firing. Now, in terms of gameplay, the construction script will only fire the moment this is spawned when you play, and then it will never fire again. So it's a way for you to have some in-editor behavior, as well as using the event graph for your in-game behavior. So in terms of that, let's take our trigger, which I just added a moment ago. I'll drag that in. Actually, let's not drag that in. I'm sorry. We're just going to select it over here in the My Blueprint list. Right-click, and at the very top, you see we can add events for it. And one of these events is called on component begin overlap, which is a little bit of a mouthful. But what that means is when we have entered the space of this volume, when it is uh, overlapping with us, we want to do something. On that note, that reminds me, over in our components, we want to make sure that that trigger has some specific collision properties. An easy way to do that is just change its presets. We'll tell it to behave like a trigger. So that's just, that happens to be one of the names of the presets. Uh, if you want to know what that does, if you're the kind of person who says, I hate presets because I never know what's going on under the hood, all it's doing is changing a series of checkboxes about uh, how you're going to collide with objects. Are you going to block stuff? Are you going to register overlaps with stuff? What types of objects do you want to collide with and not collide with and so on? We're just going to use the trigger preset for the sake of speed. And then on our component begin overlap, we want something to happen. What we're going to do is we are going to enable input. We are going to tell this light, hey, when something steps into your volume, we want you to start listening out for inputs. And that's fine. The node says that's cool, but where are we listening to, uh, to inputs from? It's going to ask you to provide a player controller. Now, in my case, I'm going to, again, cheat for the sake of speed. We are going to say get player controller, and it'll feed us one. Uh, by default, this is hard-coded to player index zero. Right now, we're, we have a single-player game, so player index zero is perfect. 
If you started having multiple players, uh, there are some nodes that you have access to that would allow you to dynamically check which player just entered uh, into the volume and then set your player controller accordingly. We're not going to worry about that in this case. So we have enabled input, and we can already kind of test this out. Uh, we just need to set up the rest of our uh, actual toggling behavior. So remember earlier, we made that action input for uh, the use event. So we slave that to the E key. So here I can just right click, and let's type use, and I get an event for that, just like we did earlier with the uh, cow self-destruct system. So what we'll do is just say, when we hit this button, we are going to take our light component, which is point light two in this case, and we are going to toggle it. We'll plug that in like so. And toggle is going to go either way, so that's fine. You don't have to worry uh, much further than that. There is one problem still remaining, but I'd rather show it to you than tell you what it is. So let's go ahead and hit play. And now I can walk up to the light. Actually, let's, let's get way back here for starters. So I'm hitting the E key, and nothing's happening. Let's walk up to the light, and now when I hit the E key, we can turn it on and off. But there's a problem. Now if I get away from the light, really far away from the light, I can still turn it on and off. That's because we enabled that input, but we never disabled it. We never told the light to stop listening to the player. So let's do that really quick. It's pretty easy to do. We just need to select our trigger, right click one more time, and this time add an event. This one will be called on component end overlap. So now we're stepping out of the volume, and what are we going to do? We are going to disable input, and just as before, it's going to say, so who should we stop listening to? Well, stop listening to that player controller we set up a moment ago. Compile, play. And now I hit it from back here, and everything's just fine. Any questions? <laughs> Excuse me. Any questions about this so far? Yes, sir? Um, so I noticed you guys, if you were using wood rings, is there any way that uh, you can actually check and actually see the code of the code as well? So at, at, at this time, there's not. Uh, that is something that we have been discussing, but I mean, until we have like actual plans on the table, I can't really talk further about it. But it does get to be compiled code, so I mean, it exists somewhere, we just haven't really gone to that other step. However, the good news is you have access to the source code. So if you want to go ahead and write that for us, then you can totally do that, and we'd probably really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm supposed to repeat the questions back, and I get carried away. The question was, uh, do you have access to the whatever the blueprint is doing in code? Meaning, like, if I create a really cool blueprint network, can I see the code that gets created under the hood and then make changes to that? And the answer is, at this time, no, but it is something we have discussed a little bit here and there. I just, I can't really promise anything until we have a plan in place, right? Were there any other questions? And I will try to repeat these. Yes, sir? Not the other way around. If you start a, a C++ project, do you get any of the visual aspects? So if you didn't hear that, the question was, uh, it, can you work the other way? Can you go from code to blueprint? And the answer is yes. That's actually what we do a lot in the studio. So a programmer can go in and create a, a class that can be fairly generic, and then start exposing elements of that class via blueprint. And then the, uh, you can use those, uh, those hooks, if you will, and change them around. So one of the things we do, for instance, is um, you know, a designer will go to a programmer and say, I need a generator that allows me to create power to power these things. But I'm not quite, you know, I don't care about what model is going to be attached and so on. So the program will create the very basic behavior in a generic class, expose the hooks that need to be changed by an artist to Blueprint, so the, the artist who knows nothing about programming can go in and make their requisite changes and turn it into anything they want. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so when should a gameplay element be in uh, Blueprint, and when should it be in uh, Z++? That's always going to be like a question, right? So the good news about Blueprint is it becomes compiled code. You're looking at uh, speeds that are very similar to what you saw with Unreal Script. So just like with any scripting language, Unreal Script included, once you start having to get really low under the hood, like individual physics calculations, like let's say you're doing a vehicle. I wouldn't necessarily do a vehicle in Blueprint because you need a lot of dynamic access to stuff going on in physics. So at that point, I would be reaching for C++ code. Uh, for most other things, things that uh, tend to run more asynchronously, use Blueprint whenever you can. I mean, it's, it's going to remain super fast, super performant. You can make entire games in it, again, because it is, in effect, a compiled scripting language. 
Yes, sir. Can Blueprint reach out and touch a MySQL database but right now? Basically, write that in C++ and suppose a few handles for the designers so they can instantiate it in the game, but on the back end here, C++ code is not going to do that. I was, I was trying to dig through all of the nodes that I know from Blueprint, and there's like thousands and thousands. There's not a native one, but it would be really easy to create. You would just create your class that handled your, uh, your SQL database, and then you, could you would just expose the hooks that an artist needed. Say, for instance, they need to populate that with an array. You would make that array public and accessible to Blueprint. They can now bring in that node. They can execute when it fires, and they can now feed an array into it and start sending stuff out to the database. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I want to make sure I have to from the beginning. The actual unique A can be run on PC and Macs. So Unreal Engine 4 can run on PC and Mac. Uh, we're not calling it UDK anymore. Uh, just and I'm only saying that because I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So UDK is still a PC product. Unreal Engine 4 is PC and Mac. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What do you do about the C++ code on Oh, so what do you do about the C++ code on a Mac? You use Xcode. <laughs> yes, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, Mac does have an IDE. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll try not to troll the Mac users any more than I have to. It's just because Andy's here. Anything else? All right, yes, sir, go ahead. Multi, multiple people editing C at once. Uh, so we can do that in Unreal Engine 4 the same way we could in Unreal Engine 3. You would use something like level streaming and make each artist responsible for a specific section of a level that gets streamed in individually. Now, when you're done, if you need to reevaluate how things are streamed in, of course, you could say, take this part that the artist was building that was streamed, and now let's make it a permanent part of this level and maybe reevaluate how everything else gets streamed in. But that's generally how we do it, right? Uh, you'll take a level, bust it up into certain sections, or in some cases, certain tasks, like uh, your you know, your high-end final look artist who may just be going in and adding bits of foliage or decals here and there, and they're all going to have their own streamed levels that represent what they're working on, and they can work on all those at the same time. And at any point, you can just uh, reload the map, and ever, all changes that have been saved out will just come right in. Anything else? All right, well, that hits us pretty much right to the mark. I want to thank all of you guys for attending. Please be sure to get your hands on Unreal Engine 4 if you haven't yet. Remember that once you subscribe, even just one time, what you get is yours to keep and will not magically stop working. So you have really very little excuse to, to not get your hands on these tools and start making games with them. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of ECGC.